why 18,000 B-24s flew with the wrong wing for combat. The B-24 Liberator's Davis wing delivered impossible performance, 1,700 mile combat radius, while the proven B-17 managed only 800 miles with identical bomb loads. Moreover, this razor-thin wing achieved 15% less drag through revolutionary laminar flow technology, enabling 18,482 Liberators to reach targets no other allied bomber could touch. Yet crews discovered this same miracle wing killed them in ways conventional designs never did, creating a deadly trade-off that defined America's strategic bombing campaign. The crisis began in 1938 when Major General Henry Hap Arnold realized American bombers couldn't reach Berlin from British bases, let alone strike Japan from Pacific Islands. Clearly, the B-17 Flying Fortress maxed out at 2,000 miles combat range, but strategic targets lay 500 miles beyond that limit. Therefore, when the Army Air Corps approached consolidated aircraft to build B-17s under license, Chief Engineer Isaac Ladin made a shocking counteroffer. Give us 30 days and we'll design something better. What emerged broke every rule of bomber design. Furthermore, the Davis Wing, named after freelance aerodynamicist David R. Davis, promised laminar flow across 20 to 30 percent of its cord compared to the B-17's 5 percent. Additionally, test data from Caltech's wind tunnel seemed impossible. 15 percent less drag at cruise speeds, 25 percent more range with the same fuel. However, Consolidated's own engineers rebelled against the design, calling it structurally suicidal for combat operations. The numbers exposed a terrifying truth. Germany's industrial heart lay 1,100 miles from British bases, while B-17s carrying 5,000 pounds of bombs could only manage 800 miles before turning back. Meanwhile, Japanese bases scattered across Pacific islands created 2,500 mile gaps between potential American airfields. Consequently, the mathematics of strategic bombing had become impossible. Then test pilot Bill Wheatley pushed the XB-24 prototype to its limits and recorded data that stunned even supporters. 273 MPH versus B-17s, 252 MPH, 2,850 mile ferry range versus 2,000 miles and a 28,000 foot service ceiling while carrying 8,000 pounds of bombs internally. Nevertheless, achieving these numbers required wing loading of 56 pounds per square foot, nearly double what combat pilots considered safe. As a result, the wing that enabled these miracle numbers would become a death trap when German flak started punching holes through its paper-thin structure. Just as Consolidated prepared for mass production, Boeing's lobbying machine went into overdrive. Specifically, Boeing executives argued the B-17 had proven itself in combat with the RAF, while the untested Liberator's radical wing would catastrophically fail under fire. Furthermore, General Oliver Eccles nearly canceled the entire program after after reviewing structural analysis showing the Davis wing had 40% less damage tolerance than conventional designs. Internal memos from March 1941 reveal Consolidated's board of directors voted 7-3 to abandon the design and switch to a conventional wing. However, only direct intervention from Assistant Secretary of War Robert Lovett, who saw production projections showing the B-24 could be built 30% faster than the B-17, saved the program. Therefore, the decision that would send 18,482 wrong-winged bombers into combat came down to manufacturing speed, not combat survivability. Engineers faced an equation with no solution. Design a bomber with 3,000 mile range, 300 MPH, speed, 30,000 foot ceiling, carrying 8,000 pounds of bombs using 1930s technology. In response, the Davis wing attempted the impossible through aspect ratio of 11.55 compared to B-17's 7.57, creating a narrow cord that sliced through air like a glider's wing, but physics demanded payment. The thin wing stored fuel in spaces barely eight 18 inches high, turning the entire wing into a 2750 gallon fuel tank wrapped in aluminum skin just 0.032 inches thick. When test pilot Danny McBride examined bullet hole tests, he reported, one incendiary round will turn this wing into a blowtorch. Yet without this fragile fuel-filled wing, the Liberator couldn't reach targets that mattered. Consequently, the very feature that made strategic bombing possible made survival questionable. The engineering philosophies couldn't have been more different. On one hand, Boeing's B-17 used a wing area of 1400 120 square feet, with conservative loading of 38.8 pounds per square foot, built to absorb tremendous punishment and keep flying. Conversely, Consolidated's B-24 compressed its lift into just 1048 square feet, accepting dangerous loading to achieve efficiency. Wind tunnel data revealed the paradox. At 10,000 feet,
8, the Davis wing generated lift coefficient of 1.5 versus B-17's 1.2, but stall speed jumped 95 MPH versus 74 MPH. As combat pilot Colonel John Killer Kane noted, the B-17 flew like a truck, slow, steady, forgiving. In contrast, the Liberator flew like a racing boat, fast, efficient, and ready to kill you if you relaxed. Statistical analysis would later show B-24s suffered 26% higher loss rates in European theater, but completed 41% more ton miles of cargo delivery in Pacific operations. The Davis wing's secret lay in coordinates David R. Davis refused to fully explain, claiming intuition guided his design. Furthermore, an ACA test at Langley revealed something extraordinary. The wing maintained laminar flow to 35% cord at cruise speed, double what theory predicted possible. Additionally, the profile's maximum thickness sat at 40% cord instead of the conventional 25%, creating a deep box beam that could carry 2,750 gallons internally. However, manufacturing this shape required precision beyond contemporary standards. Surface waviness exceeding 0.005 inches destroyed laminar flow. Consequently, Ford's Willow Run factory implemented measurement systems accurate to 0.001 inches, technology that didn't exist when the wing was designed. As a result, engineers were mass producing an aerodynamic phenomenon they didn't fully understand, sending it into combat where any surface damage would destroy its efficiency. March 26, 1940, test pilot Bill Wheatley pushed XB-24 prototype through high-speed dive when the port wing twisted violently, nearly tearing away from the fuselage. Subsequently, the aircraft landed with wing wrinkled like aluminum foil, fuel streaming from ruptured cells. Analysis revealed the Davis wing's torsional rigidity was 60% lower than predicted. High-speed airflow caused flutter that would destroy the aircraft. Consolidated's fix seemed insane. Add 800 pounds of steel cable running through the wing to prevent twisting, turning the advanced laminar flow wing into a braced biplane design hidden inside aluminum skin. As test engineer Frank Fleet wrote, we're sending crews to war in an aircraft held together with piano wire. Moreover, the second prototype suffered explosive decompression when wing fuel cells ruptured at 25,000 feet, nearly killing the crew. Yet production had already begun, too late to redesign. But then something unexpected happened. When consolidated test pilot Sam Shannon flew endurance trials, he stayed airborne for 14 hours 12 minutes on 2,400 gallons. Impossible according to calculations. Surprisingly, the laminar flow effect combined with the wing's high aspect ratio delivered 18% better fuel efficiency than wind tunnel predictions. Furthermore, maximum speed hit 303 MPH in clean configuration, faster than most fighters just five years earlier. The data seemed wrong until confirmed by three independent test flights. Combat radius reached 1,200 miles with 5,000 pound bomb load, while B-17 managed only 800 miles. After examining the numbers, Major Ruben Fleet declared, gentlemen, we've accidentally created the first intercontinental bomber. As a result, the Air Corps immediately immediately classified performance data, fearing German spies would recognize the strategic implications. By December 1941, the Liberator program faced cancellation after 18 training accidents killed 67 crewmen, most due to the unforgiving stall characteristics of the Davis wing. Meanwhile, Boeing representatives pushed General Arnold to standardize on B-17 production, presenting data showing each B-24 required 18% more training hours but suffered 31% higher accident rates. However, the Pearl Harbor attack saved the Liberator. Suddenly, American America needed bombers with range to hit Japan from distant bases, and only the B-24 could do it. Consequently, production exploded across five factories, Consolidated San Diego, Consolidated Fort Worth, Ford Willow Run, North American Dallas, and Douglas Tulsa. Ford's mass production genius Charles Sorensen redesigned assembly to build one complete bomber every 59 minutes, but privately told Henry Ford, we're mass producing an experimental aircraft that isn't ready for combat. Nevertheless, by 1943, more Liberators filled the skies than all other American bombers bombers combined. The moment ground crews first saw the B-24's fuel system, they understood why this bomber was different. As Chief Mechanic Sergeant Tony Marcelli described it, opening those wing panels was like looking inside a flying gas station. Furthermore, the Davis wing contained 18 separate fuel cells holding 2,750 gallons, interconnected by 47 transfer valves that required constant management. Each engine drew from specific cells in sequence to maintain center of gravity. Get it wrong, and the aircraft became unflyable. However, this complexity enabled something revolutionary, self-sealing cells that could absorb dozens of bullet holes and keep functioning. Additionally, the rubber-lined cells weighed 1,200 pounds, empty, more than an entire fighter plane, yet enabled 14-hour missions that redefined strategic bombing. When Colonel Jack Novi flew the first transatlantic delivery flight nonstop from Newfoundland to Scotland, he still had 400 gallons remaining after 2,880 miles. The B-17 was a regional bomber, he reported. In contrast, 
The Liberator made global warfare possible. When final production B-24J specifications reached combat units, veteran pilots couldn't believe the numbers. 278 MPH at 25,000 feet, faster than Luftwaffe bombers and matching early war fighters. Furthermore, range stretched to 1,700 miles with 5,000 pound bomb load or 3,700 miles in ferry configuration. Additionally, the Liberator could lift 12,800 pounds of bombs for short-range missions, 60% more than B-17. Service ceiling reached 28,000 feet while maintaining 175 mph cruise speed. But hidden in these impressive figures lay deadly trade-offs. Control forces doubled above 20,000 feet, stall warning came just 5 mph before departure, and structural limits sat dangerously close to normal operating speeds. As Lieutenant Frank Smith noted after his first combat mission, the Liberator gave us a range and speed by stealing every safety margin. Consequently, we were flying on the edge of disaster, held there by that impossible wing. The mathematics of the Davis wing revealed engineering elegance, hiding deadly compromise, specifically wing loading of 56 pounds per square foot, highest of any operational bomber, purchased cruise efficiency that extended range 40% beyond conventional designs. Moreover, the narrow 110-foot span generated ground effect at 50 feet altitude, enabling ultra-long range flights just above ocean waves where fuel consumption dropped another 8%. But this same loading meant approach speeds of 110 mph in an era when runways rarely exceeded 4,000 feet. Additionally, the wing's efficiency peak occurred at precisely 165 mph, indicated airspeed at 10,000 feet. Deviation of just 10 mph either direction increased fuel consumption by 15%. Combat formations required constant throttle adjustment, burning extra fuel to maintain position. Therefore, the elegant engineering solution worked perfectly in laboratory conditions, but struggled in the chaos of combat where perfection was impossible. June 12, 1942, Colonel Harry Halverson led 13 B-24Ds from Egypt to strike Romanian oil fields at Ploisti. The Liberator's combat debut ended in disaster. Four aircraft crashed, attempting to maintain formation with the unfamiliar wing. Three turned back with mechanical failures, and only six reached the target. However, those six delivered their bombs from 24,000 feet and returned safely after a 2,600-mile round trip, impossible for any other Allied bomber. Meanwhile, RAF Coastal Command simultaneously discovered the Liberator's true calling. Squadron leader Terry Bullock used the bomber's range to patrol the Black Pit, the Mid-Atlantic Gap, where U-boats operated beyond aircraft coverage. Furthermore, his modified Liberator, equipped with radar and depth charges, could patrol 1,100 miles from base and remain on station for three hours. On his third patrol, Bullock caught U-597 on the surface and sent it to the bottom. Consequently, the aircraft that struggled in bomber formations excelled when flying alone, where its efficiency could shine without compromise. Nobody anticipated the Liberator would become the war's premier submarine hunter, but the Davis Wing's efficiency made it perfect for maritime patrol. By 1943, Coastal Command operated 200 48 B-24s that closed the Atlantic Gap, sinking 93 U-boats while losing only 22 aircraft. Moreover, the wing's internal volume accommodated ASV Mark III radar, lead lights, sono buoys, and eight depth charges while maintaining 12-hour endurance. Admiral Carl Donitz wrote in his war diary, the appearance of these long-range aircraft in mid-Atlantic has rendered submarine warfare impossible. Meanwhile, stripped B-24s designated C-87 Liberator Express carried priority cargo across ocean. Surprisingly, the controversial wing that pilots feared became the foundation of global military logistics. Winston Churchill flew to Moscow in a converted liberator named Commando, trusting the fragile wing to carry him 2,500 miles over enemy territory. As a result, the bomber designed for destruction became an instrument of connection, its wrong wing enabling right missions. August 1st, 1943 changed everything. Operation Tidal Wave sent 177 E-24Ds to destroy Ploesti's oil refineries from treetop height, a mission only possible possible because the Davis Wing's ground effect allowed sustained flight at 50 feet altitude. Colonel John Killer Kane led the 98th Bombardment Group through walls of flak. His Liberator hailed Columbia, absorbing 20 million newer cannon shells through both wings. Remarkably, the fragile Davis Wing, designed for efficiency not combat, somehow held together as fuel streamed from punctured cells. Kane nursed his dying bomber 400 miles to Cyprus on two engines, the damaged wing generating just enough lift to clear mountain peaks by feet of 177 when Liberator's launched, 53 were destroyed, but they eliminated 40% of Nazi oil production for six months. Meanwhile, in the Pacific, B-24s flew the impossible hump route over the Himalayas, where the Davis Wing's high altitude efficiency meant survival. Flying at 24,000 feet through 200 mph jet streams, Liberators delivered 650,000 tons of supplies to China, when no other aircraft could manage the combination of altitude, range, and payload. Staff Sergeant Frank Eaton, tail gunner on Strawberry Bitch, described the B-24 
Singapore's dual nature. That Davis wing wanted to kill you every second. Bank too steep, snap roll into a spin. Too slow, stall without warning. But master its temperament and it would carry you across impossible distances. Statistical reality was harsh. B-24 crews suffered 71% casualties in European theater versus 66% for B-17 crews. Yet they dropped 635,000 tons of bombs, 42% of all American tonnage, despite being 30% of heavy bomber force. Colonel Leon Johnson explained the paradox. The fort was safer, but the Liberator won the war. We could hit targets the B-17 couldn't reach, carry loads it couldn't lift, and do it faster. Yes, more of us died, but we shortened the war by months. Veterans developed grudging respect for the demanding aircraft. As Radio Man Technical Sergeant Michael Kuzma noted, you didn't love the B-24 like guys love their forts. Instead, you respected it like you'd respect a barely tame predator that might turn on you, but would savage your enemies first.